All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Julie Creech, and I'd like to welcome you to today's installation of the AMSSM National Fellows Lecture Online Series. Um, today, we have the distinct honor of listening and learning from Dr. Maderick Hall as he discusses uh, groin pain in athletes. Goodness. Excuse me, that was a slight error. All right, and so today, just to um, speak to what this program is sponsored by, this is sponsored by the AMSSM Online Fellows Education Subcommittee, the AMSSM Education Committee, and the AMSSM Fellowship Committee. The goals of today's lecture are to serve as an adjunct to your individual program's educational programming, to provide fellows with direct access to educational experiences um, with those experienced AMSSM members, and at times some invited guests who are expert in their fields and a variety of different formats, and then also assist in the preparation for the CAQ exam. Some basic ground rules for today's lecture. We ask that everyone mute your device's microphone and turn off your video. We ask that um, if you have any questions during the uh, lecture that you submit them into the chat function and include your name and your program if you wish. Uh, then at the end of the lecture, I will ask the questions during the question and answer and we will have Dr. Hall answer them in the live format. And there is no um, evaluation following this lecture. So let's go ahead and get started as we listen to Dr. Madera Hall speak to the diagnosis of groin pain in athletes. Dr. Madera Hall is a sports medicine physician who specializes in the diagnosis and treatment of tendon disorders and other sports-related musculoskeletal problems. He is an internationally recognized expert in diagnostic ultrasound imaging and ultrasound guided procedures. He serves as the director for musculoskeletal and sports ultrasound at the University of Iowa Sports Medicine. He has published over 60 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters and has been an invited presenter at over 50, over 50 national and international conferences. Dr. Hall is a team physician for the University of Iowa Hawkeyes, the US ski team and USA triathlon. He regularly volunteers his time and expertise in the care of Team USA athletes across multiple sports, including the coverage of international competitions. He has also served two terms on the board of directors for the American Medical Society of Sports Medicine, AMSSM, and is the current chair for the Sports, sports Ultrasound Committee for AMSSM. Dr. Hall completed his undergraduate degree at the University of Notre Dame and medical school at the University of Illinois, Chicago of Medicine at Chicago. He then went on to complete his internship physical medicine rehabilitation residency and sports medicine fellowship at the Mayo Clinic. So without further delay, let's learn from Dr. Hall about the diagnosis of groin pain in athletes. All right, thanks so much for the invitation. Um, you know, I'm really excited to uh, be part of this symposium today on a uh, kind of a very, uh, very important area. So I will, uh, will first say that I do not necessarily consider myself an expert in, uh, in growing pain, um, but I've had to be, become, you know, at least uh, sufficiently competent in this area um, just, just by means of how common this problem is um, in the elite sport world. And so um, we see athletes, uh, both male and female, um, for, for multiple of our um, sports who come in, you know, with complaints in this area. And, uh, and admittedly, it's a super confusing area, um, lots of potential diagnoses. And so what I'm going to try to do today is hopefully break this down into like a reasonable, simplified approach, primarily based on anatomic diagnoses. And so, you know, one thing that, that I was always taught early in my training and I try to pass along to my fellows you know, is, is the concept that you find what you look for and you look for what you know. And so you need to kind of expand your, your options here and then have a, a search pattern that goes accordingly. Um, and then, you know, the, the other maxim that I always try to teach and live by is, you know, non-specific diagnoses lead to non-specific outcomes. And so, um, you know, trying to get away from this thought of, of syndromes and, and different things that, that get confusing and really don't mean a lot and trying to really nail down what's, what's the pathology here, and then what's the best way to treat that pathology? 
So I, a few disclosures here. Uh, I work with a few medical device companies. Uh, I receive some royalties. None of these are directly related uh, to our talk today. And we kind of talked about uh, our learning objectives broadly already. You know, we want to go through what the causes are, which has already been highlighted in our first talk, which is fantastic. Um, and we're going to talk about my approach here. And, you know, this is, um, you know, my level five evidence, um, but, but hopefully it'll, you'll find it helpful. And then um, talking about the importance of terminology and communication. And so there's a lot of different terms that get thrown around and, and it's fine as long as everybody's on the same page. And sometimes what we'll do is we'll run into trouble uh, where you're involving other members of your treatment team, um, which is, you know, a necessity for this condition, right? This isn't a, a one person show. Um, you're going to you know, be involving therapists and, and, and interventionalists and surgeons and everybody else. Um, everybody needs to know what the words uh, coming out of your mouth mean, right? And, uh, and, and unfortunately, that's not always the case. And so, uh, you know, whenever we hear athletic growing pain, athletic pubalgia, whatever, I kind of feel like this kiddo here, um, you know, taking a shot. Shot, um, right in the area because all these different terms get thrown around uh, and again it's it's often they, they get thrown around um, at least in my opinion you know two entirely different diagnoses get kind of lumped together um, just because they live in the same region um, you know and, and we never talk about you know shoulder dislocations and rotator cuff tears you know together right they're, they're like two entirely different things. I don't understand why we talk about adductor tears and, you know, sports hernias it, it, like they're the same thing, but that's what gets thrown around in the literature. And so hopefully we can clear some of that up um, today. So you guys have already seen this um, and, and that's great. And we're going to talk a little bit more about it. I love this diagram. Uh, I just think it's really well drawn and it's, you know, a useful way to, um, you know, just start to think about what is in this area. And so, um, uh, Weir and, uh, and colleagues published this back in 2015, and, um, and again, it's already been mentioned, but in terms of dividing this up into a few different clinical entities, so they like to think of it as adductor uh, versus iliopsoas versus inguinal related versus pubic um, related, and then separating out the hip joint, which is obviously its own beast, but certainly has some overlap and referral pain patterns here, um, and then a big, huge other category. Category, um, which we'll go through, which is, you know, an exhaustive list of, of different things um, that can cause pain in this region. One thing I don't like about that diagram is, is where's core muscle injury? You know, this is another buzz term, and I think we even have a talk later today, you know, specifically talking about core muscle injury. And, and most of our surgical colleagues, you know, at least I think at this point, this is kind of what they're referring um, to a lot of the, these, you know, pain syndromes as is core muscle injuries. And so I don't think that the, the Doha statement really you know, fully comprehends the, the concept of core muscle injury. Um, and, and here's kind of what I think of as, as a simplified version of what that means. And so we obviously know that across the core here, um, this is, you know, a large stabilizing portion from the trunk to the lower limbs. And this is why we see so much pathology here in athletes. And, and it's not just, you know, isolation of the adductors or then, you know, the core in terms of the abdominal musculature coming down, uh, but these things are intimately interrelated. There's a balance here. And in fact, there, there's actually anatomic connections. And so the aponeurotic uh, plate between the rectus and the adductors already been mentioned. This is hugely important, at least for the way I approach uh, this problem. And so we're going to talk a bit more about that uh, in a moment, but just recognizing that, you know, that this, this complex anatomy here is, is really Really critical and vital for how um, how you might choose to manage uh, these athletes. There's also going to be contributions uh, from the conjoint tendon, uh, from your your obliques, and there's even some overlap here with uh, with actual muscle injury of those uh, abdominal muscles as well. Um, so, and, and then we can see the, the, you know, inguinal floor sits very close here. Uh, and so there's certainly going to be some overlap with these inguinal disorders as well uh, with the core muscle injury. So just to highlight again, the complex anatomy that you're going to see here, um, you know, here's the pubic symphysis. We're going to have our rectus abdominis coming from the top, our adductor coming from the bottom. 
Um, what's actually interesting is these things will blend across and you'll even get some uh, crossover here. So you'll get some contribution to the opposite side um, as well as the, uh, you know, both contralateral and ipsilateral sides as things blend across. Um, and so this is one of the reasons why, you know, sometimes you'll get um, these changes across the pubic symphysis that may not be necessarily related to the pubic symphysis itself, uh, but rather all these uh, uh, muscular and aponeurotic attachments uh, to the bone there. Um, so you can see in the, the, the skeletal model here, we've got rectus, we've got the pectineus, which usually, um, you know, isn't something overly in place. It's a little bit more medial, but this will be uh, an area I, I have seen pathology there before, um, kind of strange, but it does happen. Um, inguinal ligament here, and then as we move um, down, we're going to see our adductor uh, longus, which is our main um, main issue here, at least in my clinic, our adductor brevis uh, muscular attachment, and then even the gracilis, um, which comes a bit farther down here and certainly gets um, gets challenging, um, but is not um, it is not something that, that can't get injured. And so I have seen issues down here uh, as well. So we're getting complicated anatomy. Um, all this stuff crosses over through this area. And this is kind of what folks are referring to, you know, as, as really the core uh, muscles. So, so what about sports hernia? You know, that that's probably the most common thing that gets thrown around, at least in the, you know, in the media. And um, and it's it's come under fire of late, where a lot of people saying, you know, don't use that term, and and there's a lot of confusion with it. Um, I honestly don't mind the term um, if you know what that term means. And to me, there, there is an actual definition for sports hernia, uh, and it's going to be weakness or insufficiency of the transverse halus fascia. And so there's not a true hernia, and so that's why some folks don't like, um, you know, to use the, the sports hernia lingo because there's not an actual hernia. Um, but you know, this refers to this, you know, weakening and this bulge of the transverse halus fascia, um, and then often in what, what we'll use at least on ultrasound is going to be movement or lateralization of the spermatic cord is our kind of our cue um, that this has become functionally insufficient. For me, I think this is an important thing to recognize because the location of pain seems to be different than what we're going to see with adductor related. And so it's going to move um, lateral and superior away from the adductor insertion point. And so, um, so I kind of highlighted it here, at least for me, I, I'll sometimes even see this extending up, you know, a bit, uh, a bit higher here. And so I always will have the athlete kind of point to where they're location of maximal pain is, um, you know, and if they're pointing off of the, you know, midline and they're kind of lateralizing up here, um, then I'm certainly thinking more of this, these sports hernia um, problems. And so, again, um, just, you know, I I'm fine using this term as long as you know what it means. I think a lot of folks will use, you know, inguinal disruption or, you know, what, what I'm a big fan of is actually just calling the pathology as you see it. So I'll call it transversalis insufficiency, um, which I think people uh, understand what that is. So here's the list, uh, again, from Weir's paper, on the other causes of growing pain. And it's, uh, you know, it make, makes your head spin, right? You have all these different things going on. But I think, you know, what this mostly highlights here is the importance of being able to make a, an anatomic diagnosis. And so, you know, you've got the, the usual suspects living over here. Um, and I'll go through how I divide these up actually a little bit further. Um, but I like to be able to have you know, my clinical history, my physical exam, and my imaging all correlate so that I feel like I have a true anatomic diagnosis. Um, if I don't, then that's whenever you have to start going through the laundry list of all these other things that are going on. And certainly um, there may be components of the history that are going to point you over here, you know, things such as stress fractures, um, you know, or, uh, you know, tumors, um, those sort of things. But, but sometimes, you know, the presentation can be pretty similar for these. And so, you know, if I'm having relatively normal imaging of my usual suspects, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to start moving down uh, the list here and making sure I'm not missing something else. So here, here's how I approach this area and, um, and how I like to divide things up. And I've roughly put this in order of how these will present in, in my clinic, at least in terms of the, the, the prevalence in the athletic population that I see. And that's, that's by and large, um, you know, collegiate athletes. Um, 
So first thing is going to be your isolated adductor tendon or muscle problems. And so these, you know, can, can certainly have some overlap in pain, but by and large, they're going to point, you know, right to the adductor origin, you know, fairly midline, slightly lateralizing, and then with pain radiating down into the adductor. And we'll go through, you know, the various things you can see with this, but this may be from, you know, acute tears to chronic tendinopathy, uh, but it kind of stays in the adductor region. Um, the next in what I often see here is really a progression of injury. This is, you know, what I think happens is that it moves from the adductor into the core muscles, from the adductor into the rectus abdominis. And now we start to get, you know, what's really a core muscle injury. It's no longer an isolated adductor problem. Yeah, and this to me, you know, these two things I'm going to approach differently. Uh, and I think, like I said, this is a progression um, into this. And, and I'm going to start thinking, um, you know, if if it's an elite athlete, if time really matters, we're going to start thinking potential surgical interventions earlier um, than later, where that's, you know, almost unheard of for an isolated adductor. Uh, next is going to be the sports hernia or the inguinal related disorders. And again, these are going to be somewhat lateralizing um, and a little bit above the area that we're talking about down here. Um, then we have iliopsoas, uh, muscle tendon uh, disorders. Usually these present a bit differently. Um, you know, I'm not often having a diagnostic dilemma with, uh, you know, with, with iliopsoas stuff from the usual uh, growing issues, but, but you can. And this is another just common problem too. And so it's certainly, uh, you know, certainly on the list. And if you have an athlete with relatively diffuse pain or acute symptoms, um, it may be hard to tease out exactly what it is. So this is certainly something that should be looked at uh, in the area. Isolated pubic symphysis disorders happen. Um, I don't think they're quite as common as people maybe thought previously, now that we understand everything else in that area a bit better. And I think a lot of times this is a, is a secondary problem. So either we're seeing imaging findings there that are really more related to the adductor and the, the core muscles across that area, or potentially it's um, you know related to, to FAI or some of the other things that have already been alluded to. We know that some of these hip conditions are not uh, isolated to the hip and they certainly can change the entire uh, dynamic across the pelvis and so um, so it's fairly rare um, to see isolated pubic um, symphysis disorder certainly we'll see them more uh, in females than males but you can um, you know you can see stuff here particularly if you take care of um, you know, of, of high trauma athletes. And so we'll get some, you know, rodeo folks that come in, you know, that have unstable pubic symphysis from big trauma, as you can see this, uh, you know, from other um, high, high injury sports uh, as well. And so just remembering that as, as a thing and potentially, you know, assessing for stability there, um, you know, with, uh, with ultrasound, with single leg X, um, standing x-rays um, and keeping it on your list. Uh, the hip joint, hip joint's its own thing, um, but certainly people can have varying referral patterns uh, from the hip joint. And so, you know, people can get pain in this whole general area. So you always have to consider that uh, on your list. Um, and then, like I said, what the contribution might be there um, to secondary sources of pain, um, you know, elsewhere. Uh, proximal rectus femoris I put on here. Again, usually this is lateralizing. Usually it's not in the same thing, but super common. Uh, we see a lot of these, um, you know, both with rectus and iliopsoas, these hip flexor injuries, right? And so it's always something just to keep, um, you know, keep on your radar um, that might be, you know, contributing or clouding the, um, the situation here. And then there's the other, the big, the big rest of the thing that, you know, I hope I don't get to, and I'm going to kind of check off all the, the very common things that we run into in sports clinic. And if I'm not satisfied here, um, then we got to, you know, we got to go pull out the chart and start going down uh, that next pathway. The other thing just to remember that gets really confusing here is that, you know, a lot of times these things aren't happening in isolation. So the easiest growing pain patient I'm going to see is the athlete who comes in with an acute uh, adductor avulsion. They didn't have any pain. They, you know, they, they stepped around, they got tackled funny. Now they've got horrible growing pain and they pop their adductor off. Like that's the easiest thing in the world. Um, once these things kind of become chronic and they start to settle in, it gets really difficult sometimes to tease everything out. You know, what really started this problem? Um, what has been, you know, developed, uh, you know, due to secondary issues and compensation and, and, and everything else, um, you know, it gets tricky. And sometimes it's just, you know, peeling away the layers of the onion until you can really get down, um, 
you know, to what the, the core of the problem was. And so um, try not to get too confused with that. You know, the goal is really try to get back to the original presentation of their history, try to find out what, you know, what was going on. And sometimes you just start treating things. Um, it's kind of seeing what you can get better and what kind of hangs around um, and have to be very patient with your approach um, in certain cases. So, so here's how, how I'm going to approach an athlete if they come into my clinic. And so first and foremost, I'm going to get radiographs. And so we talk a lot about MRIs and ultrasounds and, and they're fantastic imaging modalities and I use them both. Um, but don't forget good old x-rays because for me, the x-ray is going to frame everything that I'm going to do um, in that encounter. So it's going to give me a lot of really quick information. Uh, gives me the lay of the land, lets me know, um, you know, what the, the bony anatomy looks like. And depending on what I see on that radiograph, you know, it might change a little bit in terms of how I approach um, the history and certainly the physical exam. So I like to get those coming in the door. Um, then we're going to do a careful history, a very careful physical exam. Um, you know, I, as a, you know, it, it's for my job, I'm not really a you know primary care provider or anything. Thing. Most of these folks are coming to me either because um, people are, are very um, concerned and invested in them. They, you know, they have a very quick timeline to, the, to their nature in athletics, or this is a referral, you know, a subspecialty referral. Um, and so I'm getting advanced imaging on like every one of these people. Um, it's just the nature of, of how they're going to present to my clinic. Um, and then certainly diagnostic injections that have been mentioned before. And these can be helpful, particularly when you're trying to tease out some of the various components of, of where the pain's coming from. And so we we will use these pretty liberally in our clinic, particularly if there's any, um, you know, surgical planning going on, just so that we have a better sense uh, of what the true pain generator is. Um, and that can be important, too, because we know that, especially in athletes, there's lots of asymptomatic imaging findings. And so I am a big advocate for imaging, um, you know, and part of that's my bias, as is, you know, my, uh, my day job is, a, is an ultrasound imager. Um, you know, and I think it's very helpful, but you also have to put that in context and realize that you might be seeing things on imaging that have nothing to do with anything. Um, and if you can't sort that out on your history and exam, that's where diagnostic injections can sometimes be very, very helpful. So when I get radiographs, um, what I'm going to look for are, are a couple major things. And so this is going to be kind of your screening. I'm, again, I'm going to look at this before I even go see the patient. Uh, do they have FAI? If they do, I need to make sure that that's not contributing in some manner. Uh, again, common finding may or may not be, be the deal, but I want to know if they have it. Um, do they have obvious synthesis changes? Um, again, that might help me as well. And then something else not to forget um, is, is apophyseal injuries. And this isn't just something in like little kiddos. You know, some of these apophyses do not close until the early mid 20s. And so, you know, even if you're seeing a you know collegiate athlete population like I am, you may run into um, into some issues with the apophysis. And so, you know, X-rays again can be helpful. Um, just kind of seeing if you you know if you pick any of this stuff up um, going in that might slant your exam a little bit. So the history, I want to know what the mechanism of injury was and what's the chronicity. And so this sometimes gets lost, even though it's like, you know, medicine 101. Um, but this is super important. And so, you know, did, did our athlete, you know, have a, you know, a tug or a pull in the growing when she was going to kick the ball or going to change direction on the field, um, you know, has just been lingering and, and going on for several months. Um, is this the first time they ever felt the pain? Uh, do they have pain for, you know, 12 hours because they took a shock to the going with the ball, right? Like, like that's an entirely different scenario. Um, but I've seen sometimes that stuff get a little bit lost, and then you're uh, you're kind of going down the, the wrong pathway. Um, and then the other thing is going to be particularly with the more chronic symptoms is what what are the aggravating factors, and so what are the things that reliably um, aggravate this? And so there's certainly going to be your your sport specific maneuvers that you want to determine, but other things you know thinking about you know coughing, sneezing, Valsalva. Um, this is going to help point you maybe in a different direction. So on physical exam, you know, a lot of this is, is going to be palpation um, and you want to really know where the tenderness is and what reproduces their usual symptoms. So this is a tender spot. So if everybody, 
um, you know, starts poking around on their own growing right now, you're going to find that most of these areas don't feel so great um, to have a finger jammed in, right? And so you really are looking for not, you know, does this hurt, but does this reproduce your typical pain um, that you're describing? And sometimes it's, it can be helpful to poke run on the other side just to give them a reference point of like, yep, this is kind of an uncomfortable spot. Um, you know, does the other side feel different than this? Uh, and as was already mentioned, I mean, this is obviously a, um, you know, a sensitive area. And so just try to set yourself up for success with this, you know, having, I mean, I think this is pretty standard practice nowadays, but, you know, having chaperones in, um, you know, making sure that, that you balance out males and females appropriately um, based on everybody's comfort level uh, and just being very open and, and honest with the patient about what you're going to do, telling them where you're going to be at, you know, telling them it's an uncomfortable area. If you're uncomfortable, you know, let me know. I, I say all that stuff right up right away just to kind of set the tone and, and just try to make the athlete as comfortable as possible because um, there's often a lot of anxiety and apprehension you know coming into these appointments um, just because it's such a sensitive area um, that, you know, that they're having to deal with. So besides your palpatory exam, you're going to obviously try to stress the area. So you want to do resisted adduction, trunk flexion, hip flexion. You're going to have them valsalva. Um, and so there's various things that we're trying to stress all these different regions um, to, to evaluate what is, is going to reproduce their usual symptoms. Uh, you want to want to look for true hernia. Certainly, folks will, will just get a hernia, um, and that's why they come in. And you certainly don't want to don't want to lose that diagnosis in the mix of all this other stuff. Um, you know, so so make sure you you, you consider that. Um, the hip joint exam is, is kind of a non-specific exam, but it certainly helps exclude hip related disorders. And so I think it's helpful to do a hip joint exam on everybody just to see what happens. You know, and sometimes everything's so fired up in the adductors that all the hip provocative stuff kind of hurts but it hurts over here. Um, but if they have a negative hip, hip joint exam, that's, that's certainly helpful uh, in starting to cross that off the list. Um, as mentioned before, you know, the x-rays as well as the history are really going to help me focus um, you know, this exam. You know, if we see FAI, I'm going to spend a bit more time on the hip joint exam than if we don't. Um, you know, same thing for, for pubic symphysial um, issues. Um, and then, you know, again, I'm somewhat biased here, but ultrasound, I think, really helps even if you're not um, necessarily comfortable with all the advanced level uh, diagnostic stuff here, simply knowing that you're pushing on what you think you're pushing on um, is really helpful. So there's a, this stuff's all super close. And, um, and you know, I, I'm not necessarily 100% uh, confident that I'm always pushing on the right thing um, if I'm just doing a regular physical exam. And so I think, you know, a good, a good place for beginners if you have access to ultrasound is just making sure you can identify where these structures are um, so that you can, you know, precisely correlate your palpation. Uh, and then always consider the other stuff, you know, you might need to do a testicular exam, you might need to do something else, um, you know, you might you need to refer that off, you know, depending on what your practice looks like, but, but certainly just keeping that in the back of your mind. All right, so advanced imaging, um, you know, you've gotten my bias already. I, I think um, you're going to get a lot of, of controversy here, but I think advanced imaging is critical in really making an anatomic-based diagnosis. And so uh, I don't like to guess. I like to know what's going on. And, um, and you know, and if imaging is normal uh, versus abnormal, that, that's really helpful for me in terms of how I'm going to approach uh, something uh, and what else I might do. So, so I think it's critical here, and I'm a liberal uh, imager. Um, particularly in elite sport um, and anybody who deals in elite sport you know if you're if you're talking syndromes and gray area and let's give it some time and let's do six months of rehab without a diagnosis um, that athlete's going somewhere else um, and, uh, and you're not going to make any headway all right so uh, some of this has been touched on in the previous talk but when we're looking at ultrasound versus mri there's different reasons you might pick uh, one of these up over the other um, the first thing that i'd like to say and, and this is a bit of my soapbox but but everybody always you know talks about how how operator dependent ultrasound is um, and, and certainly that's true no doubt but mri is every bit as operator dependent as ultrasound is and do not forget that particularly in this area if you order a generic pelvis mri at you know Joe's uh, MRI shack down the street, uh, it's going to be 100% worthless for this problem. So um, you really need to work with your radiologist. You need to develop a, you know, a sports hernia, athletic growing pain, whatever you want to call it, protocol um, that actually has the right 
um, the right specs to be able to evaluate any of this stuff. Um, I'll tell you, even with that, you know, MRI is somewhat limited in what it's going to be, be able to see for your tendon resolution. You're going to get a couple of slices through, um, and, you know, people talk about the cleft signs and stuff, which certainly can be helpful, um, but I've seen plenty of uh, adductor-related pathology get missed on the MRI simply because it just didn't get uh, the right cuts. And so the advantage with ultrasound is you have an infinite number of imaging planes um, that you can go through and you're just going to get much better resolution uh, for these core muscles than you are on MRI. Um, MRI is going to give you good bony detail. It's going to give you much better uh, uh, sense of bone edema, uh, pubic symphysis issues. Certainly it's going to um, be the imaging modality of choice if you're talking about hip-related disorders. Um, and gives you a nice big picture, uh, but ultrasound is going to give you a, the dynamic assessments. You're really not going to be able to evaluate a, a sports hernia with MRI, um, and, and again, you're going to be able to correlate this with the palpatory pain and with your physical exam, um, and not even just palpation, so I'll correlate this with the dynamic uh, stress maneuvers as well while we watch these, uh, this, these tissues work, and, uh, you know, and I think ultrasound is certainly um, you know, the superior imaging modality here, but you know, with that, it takes a lot of work um, to get comfortable looking at these areas. Um, and, um, you know, and, and it does probably take a, a relatively uh, high quality ultrasound unit, um, particularly in some larger patients. Oops, sorry, that one blew through. So diagnostic injections uh, are best for excluding hip joint related pain. Um, it, it, and it's the nice thing there is the hip joint is a very confined space, right? So you can put some local anesthetic in the hip joint, you know where you're at, you numb that area up. Um, and that's, you know, is very helpful in ruling in or out um, hip joint related pathology. Once we start meandering over to the other areas, um, it gets a little bit confusing because even being very precise where you place, uh, you know, uh, anesthetic injection, you know, you're going to get some, some overflow into the, into the surrounding structures a bit. Um, and so it, it gets a little bit more challenging, um, but certainly it's very helpful for the, for the joint uh, related issues. Um, do be aware of volume effects. And so this isn't as big a deal in the hip joint, but you know, don't put you know 15 mLs in the hip joint, right? Because then you're just going to blow this whole thing up, and even though it's numb inside, you're still going to have this pressure-related pain that's going to cloud your picture. So, so be reasonable with volumes, and then particularly if you're trying, if you're considering a diagnostic injection for the pubic symphysis, um, I hate doing these injections. I try to push off these theology of nodule under fluoro just because they're they're just uncomfortable injections. I just don't like doing them because they hurt uh, and there's not a lot of space in there to take uh, any medication. And so if you try to pump in, you know, two, three mLs into the pubic symphysis, um, that, that patient is not going to like you. And it's going to be really difficult to assess, you know, what their response was to a local anesthetic portion of that. Um, so just be aware, um, you know, certainly we will use these injections at time and steroid may have some, some benefit here um, in terms of the, the, the more prolonged effect uh, or at least intermediate. But, um, but just remember that some of these spots can be painful. Um, and even with the local anesthetic, folks just don't like the, the volume in these areas. Uh, and that goes for the, the abdominal region uh, as well. All right, so we're gonna walk through um, a few, a few different cases just to demonstrate what some of this pathology looks like and then what, uh, you know, what the approach might be uh, for that athlete. So we'll start with isolated adductor tendon and muscle injuries. And so as I said before, this is my favorite case to get um, because these folks just tend to do well, uh, even though it's the most dramatic presentation. And so here's a NCAA football linebacker. Um, you know, you see him go down on the field. It looks bad. He limp, you know, limps off. You know, he gets bruising and stuff on his leg. Everything's, you know, um, you know, seems very dramatic. And, and we scan him and indeed, uh, what we see here, if I orient you, this is proximal, this is distal. Um, so this is going to be the adductor longus tendon. Uh, its insertion is going to come down to here. This is the adductor brevis muscle, uh, which has this muscular attachment uh, here. And what we see uh, on our kind of screening exam, and again, this is a big old, uh, you know, D1 linebacker here. So we've got the curved 
uh, on first just to give us a big picture. And we see uh, we're not really happy with our image here, right? We, we don't see really nice um, tendon fiber definition. Um, this certainly correlates with this area, you know, of, of uh, pain. And so we switch to a linear transducer to give us a better resolution. And then we can see indeed, he does have a uh, relatively significant tear of the adductor longus uh, acutely here. Uh, so this book, this guy, you know, isn't going to play next week, um, but almost invariably, um, you know, these these tend to to heal up and do fine. Um, and I can't, you know, recall an athlete that we needed to do anything more than uh, conservative care um, post one of these tears. Um, sorry, my computer is twitchy here um, today. So here's going to be another example of an acute uh, proximal adductor longus tear. So this was in one of our uh, Olympic wrestlers. We'll see this a fair amount. Uh, in, in wrestlers, both male and female. Um, and here is going to be kind of this telltale sign of a, of a significant full thickness tear whenever you see this kind of rounded off edge of the tendon. So the tendon's retracted, it's started to ball up here. And then we just see this kind of empty sheath. Now don't get fooled sometimes. You, you'll kind of still see some tissue planes and such, and, and that's going to be fascial planes. You have some hematoma, you have you know, a little bit of residual stuff hanging on. Um, but you know we can see this rounded edge stump here. We know this thing's been completely torn. If we then look at the cine loop as we continue to scan down into the thigh, Again, still in the long axis, you can sort of see that this is not a diagnostic dilemma. You know, he's, he's retracted uh, portions of this way down. We got a big free fluid hematoma here um, in the adductor longus, and we can see again the, breath, the tissue plane of the brevis underneath, which is intact. So again, surprisingly, these folks always do better than I think they're going to do. Um, this guy, uh, I actually think, was able to wrestle the Olympic trials, um, you know, all, albeit not 100%. Uh, I was still able to give it a go. Uh, I think, oh man, it was like three weeks after this injury. So um, so it's surprising what some of these athletes were able to do here. Uh, and I think this will get to, to our point in a minute, um, you know, where some of these folks, if you do an adductor tenotomy, you know, actually can be an effective surgical procedure. Uh, here is another example, slightly different case, and, and just to highlight the importance of, of completing your protocol as you scan. And so this was uh, one of our uh, running backs, uh, again, had an acute uh, injury to the adductor region, and his uh, tendon actually looked okay. So when we start up at our usual spot, um, you know, over the, the pubis, we saw the tendon looked good, everything looked fine, but we came down a bit, which is, which is where he was complaining of his maximal pain. And we can see he actually had an acute myotonous junction tear. And so tendon was okay, but he had bolstered off uh, the, the muscle of that region. Um, so again, you know, dramatic uh, presentation, but you know, not much to do here. Uh, these athletes typically tend to do well. Uh, one thing I will mention, I, I should have included a slide for it, uh, but just in terms of orienting and how I'm going to do my my imaging here. Um, you know, the biggest pearl I can give you is, is to get away from doing this frog leg sort of thing that everybody tends to like to do when they're evaluating the adductors. It makes the imaging really difficult. Uh, you can't keep, uh, you know, gel on there. You, you, you can't keep good contact with your transducer. Uh, it's uncomfortable. The patient does not like to be in that position because it's tensing them. There's no way you could get this person even in that position anyways. And usually what you're looking at is much higher than you think. And so you're looking at the midline, um, you know, really in the in the pelvic region and so i have the patient just just lying supine with their um, with their uh, hip and just a comfortable amount of external rotation and that allows me good visualization and i start at the rectus abdominis and then scan down from the rectus to then find the adductor uh, longus insertion and you'll be surprised how big line this is uh, and that you really don't need to put him in some funny um, you know WWE move to uh, to try and evaluate this area and that's going to be my procedural um, uh, positioning as well which makes life considerably easier I struggled trying to do this frog leg thing um, you know for the first uh, several years of my career and it was horrible um, and this has really made a, a big difference in, uh, in my ability to get good imaging um, and do comfortable procedures all right, so um, now we'll move on to more of the chronic case. And so this is going to be your, your usual adductor longus tendinosis. And so, um, you know, at least in my practice, uh, I'd say 50% of what walks into my clinic with growing pain is this. Um, this we see in, you know, in our um, 
you know, collegiate uh, elite athletes. We'll see this really commonly in our slightly older 30, 40 year old, um, you know, distance runners and other uh, athletes. Um, this is a very common problem that we'll see. And, and what we're looking for is again, as I just mentioned, I like to start and see the rectus abdominis. Um, this is proximal and patient's head up here. Uh, we're going to follow the rectus down. We're going to see where it blends with the adductor here. So this is the aponeurotic uh, plate region. And then we're going to move Move and, and optimize our image to get a good view of the origin of the adductor longus. And so here we can see, here's the, the bottom fascial plane um, between the adductor longus and, and brevis. Here's going to be the superficial aspect. And so we can see this kind of fusiform swelling of the tendon. But where your money usually is, is going to be at the deep side. So we can see this cortical regularity here. We see a region of hypoechogenicity, uh, really anechogenicity here. So this is, you know, a tiny little micro tear uh, of the tendon. But what we don't see is these changes extending up um, superiorly to involve the rectus. And so that's really the, the most important thing that I look for in determining is this an isolated adductor injury or have we really started to go into the rectus and is this starting to move up the chain to really this core muscle injury pattern? Um, and then that's going to change my, uh, my treatment options here. So isolated adductor, everything looks good at the rectus. How are we going to manage this? And so uh, this is really a, a therapy sort of sort of a problem. And so you want to do a progressive tendon loading program. And, and, and that's really how you should always think about this is progressive loading. And so a lot of folks um, where they go wrong is they don't load the tendon in a progressive manner. They'll start with some very low level exercises and they never progress. And so, you know, I usually tell my my uh, my athletes to Google Copenhagen protocol and look at some of these crazy exercises. And that's the stuff we want them to be able to do if they want to get back on the playing field. And if anybody's tried this, uh, if you haven't, please don't try level three here uh, because you'll look like one of those adductor tears uh, I showed you before. Uh, but these are pretty challenging exercises and, uh, and certainly what's going to be required if you want to get back to, you know, elite level sport. And so, uh, um, so that's that's usually where I see people go wrong um, is not progressing through the protocol enough uh, and staying with things. Um, we certainly will consider PRP as an adjuvant here. Um, you know, I've had anecdotally pretty good success um, with using uh, fairly rich plasma at this area, but we always couple it with an appropriate uh, rehabilitation protocol, uh, which is really the core. And we don't have good evidence on, you know, who, who needs PRP, who's going to do well with just rehab if you give them enough time. Um, but I will say PRP has been, um, been a safe treatment, uh, at least in my hands, without any significant complications. And we've had uh, a response. Um, if this stuff is not working, certainly not, it can be a concern um, and not respond to uh, this uh, approach is that, um, uh, which we won't go into in exhaustive detail. So, you know, if, if you're thinking rehab here, my pearl is just remember Sir Mix a lot. Um, you know, there's nothing wrong with, with Jane's workout here, but we really need to progress beyond the developer, right? Um, when we're trying to get these athletes back. So, here is just a couple of procedural videos. Uh, just to demonstrate, so uh, in some of these recalcitrant cases, you know, you can consider ultrasound guided needle tenotomy. Uh, with platelet-rich plasma, so that's what we're doing in this uh, in this video here. Um, this is uh, distal on your left, proximal on your right. Here's our area of pathology. Uh, we can see the needle is kind of coming in and fenestrating this area um, to break up some of this degenerative tissue, and then. Uh, PRP injection will be performed. The biggest thing to remember here is going to be to don't fenestrate the spermatic cord. Don't Kind of like that, uh, and it sits right in your way. So you know, I'd love to come in right, right through here every time, and it's 
always right there uh, and it drives me crazy. And so I struggled with this for a long time um, coming in from this distal to proximal approach. And so usually to do this, you have to put a little bend in your needle. Uh, you got to finagle around this thing. It's ergonomically, you know, pretty challenging. And so uh, more recently, I got away from that approach. And I typically now will use a proximal to distal approach. So I'm still in the long axis. So here's going to be uh, the pubic tubercle. Here's going to be the adductor longus tendon coming down here. Uh, and I typically will come from above. And, uh, and then down right into the adductor this way. Um, and this has worked out you know, ergonomically a bit better for me. Um, you know, this is an uncomfortable area for the patient. You know, we try to use good local anesthesia with a very small gauge needle before coming in here. Um, but but this, this unfortunately is an area that, that still is, you know, just a bit uncomfortable um, to have procedures done in. All right, so we'll move. Um, uh, to be the core muscle injury. And so as I showed you before, you know, here's our normal, here's our rectus, here's our adductor. This is what we want it to look like. And, and this is that progression that I'm looking for. So this was a, uh, one of our quarterbacks who had, um, you know, adductor related pathology. Um, but what we can see here is there's, you know, partial tear of the adductor longus, but it's starting to move north. It's starting to move proximal and involve that aponeurotic plate with the rectus abdominis. And these are when I start to worry uh, a bit because these, at least in my experience, do not tend to do as well with rehab. They don't tend to do as well with injections. Um, and in the, you know, the, the elite sport world, this is somebody who you, I, I think is reasonable to start considering uh, earlier surgical consultation for. Um, just given the, you know, the reported success rates with, with surgery um, and our, our lack of ability to get a lot of these folks back. If you've got time on your side, um, certainly there's no reason you can't rehab these, um, you know, potentially consider other adjunct treatments like PRP, but um, but I certainly would temper my expectations compared to uh, just the isolated adductor pathology. So as mentioned, um, surgery here is, is certainly a reasonable option. Um, this area gets confusing, and I'm glad uh, we'll be a talk later about uh, about some of this um, because it's you know if you read the literature, it's it's all over the place in terms of varying techniques, and some of the trouble is is what people are treating as well, right? And so um, so I think it's just important to have a good working relationship with whoever um, you know may be doing uh, surgery here and making sure every one's on the same page with what you were uh what you're talking about and so are you talking about the case i just showed where there's um you know really an injury up into the rectus abdominis and the adductor um but the the um you know transversalis fascia looks fine there's no or inguinal um, disorders or sports hernia, you know, or are you talking about, you know, a case where uh, where it's a sports hernia and, and the core muscles are fine? That, that's an important um, distinction that really needs to be made. And sometimes even, even reading through the literature, it is not clear um, that everybody's on the same page in what they're talking about. Despite that, um, surgery outcomes are really good. And so, so people just tend to do well. Um, you know, almost regardless of what you do down here. Um, I've even, you know, had some cases where I felt like the athlete got the wrong surgery and they still did well. Um, and so, you know, it's it, it's one of these things that because the outcomes seem to be well and the return to play seems to be quick, um, you know, this is an area that I think we are, are much more apt to move towards surgical management um, than many of the other regions um, where, where surgery ends up being a much longer recovery process. Uh, also, don't forget that things can happen up in the abdominal muscles themselves um, that can still refer pain to this area. So here is an elite gymnast I saw um, who had, you know, pain kind of in this general region. And, uh, and we thought her aponeurosis looked reasonable, but we came up just a little bit proximally into the meat of the rectus abdominis. And we can see she actually had an acute tear of the rectus abdominis. So here's just a showing this uh, with, uh, per, you know, pretty pronounced hyperemia throughout that zone. Um, so she just had a little, little ab tear. Um, and so this was, a, you know, again, a much better scenario for her. Um, this just required a little training modification. We'll rest for a couple of weeks and she was good to go, um, as opposed to, you know, getting into any of the, the chronic stuff um, a bit further uh, down towards the attachment. <laughs> 
All right, sports hernia. So, so admittedly, I hate sports hernia evaluations. Um, I don't like doing this. Uh, and uh, and I borrowed some videos here from uh, my good friend Tony Joseph, who is uh, you know an expert at this area, um, and had much better uh, demonstrative videos than I do. But you know, the key here is really going to be you know finding the right location uh, that athlete who has pain you know a bit superior and lateral uh, to where we were just at over that rectus and, and adductor aponeurosis. And then what we want to do is do a dynamic scan with Valselva. So this is going to be the rectus abdominis over here. The transversalis fascia is going to form a little hammock that the spermatic cord sits in. And as these cine loops play through, what you'll see is this tissue right here, just lateral to the rectus, is going to move up. And the transversalis fascia is going to bulge and the spermatic cord is going to move laterally. And so that's what we're seeing on both of these. Again, tissue moves up bulging of the transversalis fascia, spermatic cord shoots over to the lateral aspect. And when you see that, that is that is this insufficiency of the transversalis fascia we're talking about. There's not a true hernia. The, the fascia maintains intact here, um, but it's it's an insufficiency. And that's, that movement of the spermatic cord is kind of what we use as our, um, you know, as our key. Here's just another example, slightly more, uh, more subtle, subtle where we have the He's rectus of abdominis muscle here. Like and right we'll right see uh, the spermatic cord again, just shooting over a bit laterally as the muscle kind of sneaks up along the lateral edge of the rectus abdominis here. So, so find your spermatic cord, um, take them through these valsalva maneuvers and then, and then see what happens. Um, admittedly, this area is a little confusing. Um, as I mentioned, Dr. Joseph uh, is an expert here, and he gave a really nice webinar um, in conjunction with uh, AIU and AMSSM um, that's, a, that's available on their website. Uh, and he, he goes through all this stuff, and I think it's really helpful. So if you're interested here, you want to you know, dive into that a bit more, uh, particularly in, in the nuances, the scanning technique and everything, um, you know, I definitely recommend that. Um, so this is not a, a mistake in terms of the slide, you know, I just kind of crossed off core muscle injury and put sports hernia here, uh, again, just because, you know, these things get, get confusing when you read, you know, what's going on. I, I feel like we're almost to the point where folks are getting this a bit, a bit better, uh, handled now and, and folks are starting to, you know, recognize, you know, you kind of fix what's broken, right? You reattach the rectus if it's bad, you know, does that go into the inguinal area? Do you need to do some, some augmentation repair there? There, uh, you know, making sure that repair, you know, doesn't allow anything to move um, lateral to the rectus and, and, um, and addressing adductors if need be. And so, so again, just making sure everybody knows what pathology we think we're treating uh, and that we're not going to, you know, say do a, uh, you know, an inguinal, um, you know, hernia repair technique whenever we think the pathology all sits in the adductors, right? And, and I've seen that done before, unfortunately. Uh, and I think it was just a confusion of, of who, you know, what people were, uh, were defining as a sports hernia. All right, last thing I'll just touch on here uh, briefly is going to be iliopsoas. Um, just because I feel like this is something that we see a lot um, for ultrasound referrals, uh, and it's helpful to be able to, to kind of quickly orient yourself here uh, if you do find yourself a little bit lateral uh, in this region. So, so here's going to be the, the iliopsoas, uh, kind of in your normal view, orienting off of the femoral neurovasculature. So the anatomy here gets a little bit more complicated um, than I think what a lot of people think about, but this is important and key to understanding the dynamic component here if you're looking at a snapping psoas. And so the psoas major tendon is going to be what most of us call the iliopsoas tendon, um, and we're going to see it sitting right here over the, uh, uh, the superior pubic ramus. The iliacus is this huge muscle, and the iliacus has two portions. There's a medial and a lateral portion. You often will see this fascial distinction between between the two. Um, and that gets important uh, just to recognize because you're going to also start to get a tendon of the iliacus that starts to form. Uh, and there's some variability in terms of when that tendon is going to form, when that's going to blend um, with the psoas major tendon component. Uh, and this will lead to a lot of things that might look like, you know, bifid tendons, or you might have, have two different things. It looks kind of, you can see a lot of stuff here that looks kind of weird. Uh, but if you just start back um, a bit above the AIIS oriented 
muscles follow the tendons down. You can usually make sense of everything here. Um, and then make sure you have a good understanding of the, the anatomy before you start moving folks around, trying to figure out what's popping or snapping. Um, you know, for years, people thought that the psoas tendon snapped medial to lateral over this iliopectineal eminence. Um, that's been debunked. And so what actually happens is there's dyskinetic movement of the tendon in relation to the muscle. And because of the, um, the anatomy of the pelvis here, you basically have a you know, big amphitheater. And so that's why this is going to be one of these few snapping um, syndromes where you can actually hear it across the room because it's going to get amplified out of the pelvis. And so what you should do do is as you bring the, the patient up into hip flexion, uh, abduction and external rotation, you're going to see the tendon normally will roll. It's going to move on top of the muscle. So you're going to have tendon, which is here, muscle underneath of it. And then as you start to move back into neutral, the tendon usually smoothly moves around. The muscle moves out of the way. There's kind of this little roll and then it takes its position up against the bone. In folks uh, who have snapping here, what you'll see is a dyskinetic motion where the tendon will suddenly move and then will snap down onto the bone and that will correlate with their snapping. So here's just a few more examples of what that may look like. Here was a case where, um, where this young athlete's hip felt like a, a bowl of Rice Krispies. Um, you had this snap, crackle, pop thing. Uh, and that's because we have this uh, psoas major tendon component and the iliacus tendon component here. And, and all of them are snapping over everything. So this one pops up, that one pops up, that one pops down, this one pops down. Uh, but we were able to demonstrate that you know, quite nicely on the uh, dynamic images. This is going to be your usual look. And so we've got the tendon here that's, you know, that, that I described as kind of being loaded. So it's loaded up here right now, and then it's going to fire and move down very quickly. And you'll feel that right under your transducer. Oftentimes in this case, um, this is going to make a dramatic popping noise um, that everybody in the room can hear. Um, and then you can, you know, um, confirm your diagnosis. All right, folks, so uh, take home points from today's uh, lecture. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, nonspecific diagnosis, sleep and nonspecific treatment, which leads to nonspecific outcomes, right? So, so really try to, to establish a firm diagnosis, if at all possible. And the vast majority of these cases that are going to come in are going to be exactly what I presented. Um, you know, certainly there's going to be, um, you know, all those other conditions on the other list. Um, those are going to walk into clinic as well. And you want to make sure that you pick those up. Uh, but if you feel pretty confident, and the stuff we just went through. Um, this is really common pathology and you're going to see a ton of it. Um, and, and I think you can quickly get pretty comfortable um, with recognizing it. Um, you know, I would say avoid syndromes and broad general, generalized classifications. I just don't find it helpful. Um, I've never understood this whole syndrome thing. To me, a syndrome is something if you just can't figure out the diagnosis. Um, and so really, you know, try, try to get a diagnosis. Um, you know, along that line, I find that, that liberal use of imaging here is helpful, um, but you have to understand that you're going to you're going to see asymptomatic findings, um, and you have to correlate your clinical history and your physical exam. So you know the image is not the only thing you're looking at. You know, it's the big picture, um, but I do think this area with all of the the various pathology that can happen in a very confined region with overlapping referral pain patterns, uh, you know I, I don't think you can take good care of patients uh, and athletes without uh, without imaging in this location. So I will call uh, that good. Uh, we've got hopefully a few minutes here for questions uh, from the audience that I can uh, maybe attempt to answer. All right, wonderful. So I'm gonna stop sharing here um, and start with one of the questions of my own for um, Dr. Hall would just be, with respect to the core muscle injury, um, mentioning that they do tend to respond well to sur surgical treatment after a trial of conservative treatment, how long and to what extent do you put them through kind of the Copenhagen protocol for adductor type pathology before you would refer them on to possible surgical intervention? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Julie. And so a lot of that depends on the scenario. And so if you have a you know, general community patient who's coming in with this and, and it smells like, like adductor, um, and even if they are starting to get some rectus involvement, 
I think it's very reasonable to put them through a full trial of rehab. I think most folks would probably consider that, you know, 12 weeks or three months, um, cause it does take some time. And, uh, and if they're patient enough, um, a lot of times folks will get better with that. If you're dealing with the elite athlete population, um, I think there's, there's less, um, less patience uh, for some of these. And, you know, depending on, on exactly what, what you're finding on your imaging and how much involvement you think is sneaking out of the, the adductor, um, and if they have any other associated, you know, pathology in the rectus, any inguinal disruption, uh, I think people are starting to get a pretty itchy trigger finger to get those folks moved on to surgery. Um, you know, I'll speak, you know, for us, if, if we've got somebody who has, you know, what, what we think is kind of a sports hernia, um, we're, we're starting to move them on pretty quick just because we've been not overly uh, happy about how their rehab course has gone. Um, and even a, you know, a long period of rest for these folks usually doesn't, doesn't make a difference. So, um, but if it's all adductor, you know, those folks usually get better, but it takes a while. So short answer is probably at least three months. Great, thank you. Um, on that same note, as we wait for maybe some other questions to funnel in, um, continue on with core muscle injury. Do you see it's, you mentioned sometimes it's the progression from the adductor type pathology onto, um, involving that rectus on ultrasound as you're monitoring response to the dynamic, um, exercise protocol. Do you see a change in neovascularization progressing from the adductor proximal attachment site onto the rectus or um, what sort of things might you see as it's progressing from one or evolving to the other? Yeah, so <clears throat> the biggest thing I really look for is going to be, going to be true tearing. And so um, a lot of times what you'll see is this deep adductor pathology that often will be, you know, truly a partial tear in a lot of these athletes, you'll see some pretty crummy tissue there, but it usually stays on the deep side. And when you really uh, interrogate that aponeurosis, it's intact. And so when I start to get worried is whenever I see a tear, so that's going to be, you know, hypoechoic, anechoic um, region that extends up into the aponeurosis and into the abdomen. And what you can do is, is use your dynamic um, imaging to help with that as well. And so once you get a good view there, um, you can have them actively adduct. You can then add in an abdominal component um, to that as well and see if you can really convince yourself and demonstrate a defect um, that's going up, up into that area. And so, um, especially if the athlete's pretty fired up and, um, you know, and if, if they're, you know, still, um, you know, still training, having for come in after training, um, and then take a look through some of these dynamic maneuvers, and you'll be surprised. I mean, you'll actually be able to see some free fluid that might track up through there. Um, but I think that's really the key is is really interrogating that that aponeurosis and seeing, you know, is it all isolated to the adductor, or are you starting to get that involvement creeping up uh, into the rectus? Wonderful. Um, well, I. Oh, I do see one more question. So um, now the questions are coming in. So uh, a question would be, how frequently are you using both uh, the anesthetic and the steroid for your diagnostic injections? And what are your thoughts on potential long-term determinants for cartilage health with a steroid um, in the hip joint in young elite athletes? So that's a, that's a great question. And I would say in our hip preservation clinic, um, we do only diagnostic um, local anesthetic injections for that population. And so um, we don't, we only, you know, I, I would say we really only use steroid if, if there has, if there's arthritis present, you know, and we're, and we don't think that they're indicated for hip arthroscopy um, or in some, you know, very select cases uh, where we feel like we need to get symptom management and, um, you know, and it may not be the right, you know, right time either for surgical intervention or, or, or other treatment with orthobiologics or something else. So I would say that for the routine patient who's coming in, who are usually these younger, you know, healthy folks, um, we're, we're pretty stingy with steroids in their joint. And it's for the, exactly for the reasons that were mentioned. I think people are, are a bit more concerned 
uh, you know, you can't, you can't really run a hip preservation clinic when you're putting in something that we know doesn't preserve the joint, right? So, so I think people have moved away from that a bit. Um, we still, you know, there, there's still probably a role, but I think everybody goes into those injections a bit more eyes wide open. And, um, and we've, you know, been much more liberal with, with using, you know, PRP and such therapeutically. Um, here as opposed to steroid, but when we're trying to make diagnostic decisions, um, we are only using local anesthetic, uh, and typically, you know, we use a combination of uh, a little bit of one percent lidocaine for quick effect, and then zero point five ropivacaine, um, which seems to be the the least toxic to the joint. Great. Um... Another question came in that is, what type of surgery is normally done for the adductor tendinosis with the rectus involvement cases? Yeah, so great question. Depends on who you ask. Um, that's what I kind of alluded to, you know, lots of confusion here. I, I think that, you know, people now are starting to do um, a repair of the rectus and then a release of the adductor um, is typically what's done. And then that repair of the rectus will then either be augmented with a, um, you know, inguinal repair, um, you know, if that's, if that's um, you know, felt to be involved or not. It all depends on who you're gonna see here though. Is this somebody who's, you know, more of a general surgeon uh, kind of doing a general surgery sort of thing? Is it an orthopedic hip surgeon doing kind of an orthopedic sort of thing? Um, and there's, and there's crossover and overlap in it, in it, you know, still, still sometimes is a mystery. I, I, I read some of these operative reports that I honestly don't know, but I would say the the party line tends to be, you need to repair that adductor down and the aponeurosis down. Usually they'll do a bit of a lengthening and uh, of, of the adductor longus, um, which does make some sense, you know, as, as I alluded to some of these adductor longus tears actually do quite well. Um, so just, um, you know, doing a bit of a lengthening and it's not a complete, uh, you know, tenotomy per se, and there's still a lot of attachments, but more of a lengthening and uh, and sometimes we'll use that, uh, that lengthening um, component to do a bit of application um, for the repair as well. Awesome. Well, seeing no more questions, I just wanna thank everyone for um, virtually coming out to attend this uh, edition of the National Fellow Online Lecture Series and thank Dr. Hall sincerely for his time and uh, immense amount of education provided on this important topic. And I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thanks, everybody.